Okay, hello everyone. Uh, let me first express my appreciation to Peter and Judith for organizing this and inviting me. Uh, it is a, a great opportunity to learn from all of you about disaster ethics. And it's also a really great pleasure for me to be back here, as um, Peter said, and just to stand on this stage. <laughs> and I must confess that as a student, this auditorium seems so much bigger than it looks like right now. <laughs> but yeah, I guess there are good reasons for that. So um, instead of applying normative theories to the variety of challenges raised by disaster, I want to take a step back here and first think about the challenges raised by disaster for theories of justice. I will discuss why and how our normative theories need rethinking in the face of disaster in order to provide better responses to it. Um, I focus on relation, relational theories of justice that have a difficult relationship with disaster. More precisely, they have a problem of grounding duties of justice of affluent states to prevent or respond to natural disasters shouldered in large part by vulnerable populations in poor world regions. Part of the reason for this difficulty is that many relational theories deny that the demands of egalitarian justice extend beyond state borders because the justice relevant relation itself is thought to be absent. By contrast, disasters, by definition, extend the capacity of local and national communities and are in urgent need of international response. State-bounded relational theories argue that the duties we have towards fellow human beings is of a different kind compared to those owed to fellow citizens. They argue that some features of our relationship as co-citizens, co-nationals, or co-contributors to the collective goods produced within states trigger egalitarian duties of justice. By contrast, duties owed beyond the states are non-relational humanitarian duties, duties we owe to one another in virtue of being human um, and responding to human suffering that typically focus on basic needs. On this view, the suitable normative response to disaster is humanitarian assistance or aid. Humanitarian duties that respond to sheer human suffering may in some cases provide an effective short-term solution when disaster hits. However, humanitarian aid is much less likely to have a long-term effect on the ultimate causes of human suffering and deprivation. Moreover, it cannot provide an adequate answer to a pressing justice concern with disaster response, namely the staggering inequalities in exposure, vulnerability, and resilience between different social groups. On a more principled note, Brian Berry has pointed out the limitations of the humanitarian moral language in a powerful way. He distinguishes the principle of humanity that is goal-based from the principle of justice that is rights-based. They have very different rationales and different applications for practice. The duty of humanity is independent from the origin or cause of deprivation the claimant is suffering. Its rationale is to relieve distress no matter what caused it. By contrast, an injustice occurs when someone is denied what is rightfully, um, uh, what is rightfully hers in relation to everyone else's legitimate title. Justice establishes what is rightfully owned. It is important to point out that the difference between humanity and justice is not that the duty of humanity is a weak moral requirement or that it cannot be enforced. Rather, the point, as Barry puts it, is that we cannot sensibly talk about duties of humanity until we have a baseline set by justice. To talk about what I owe as a matter of humanity to do with what is mine makes no sense until we have established what is mine in the first place. Unless just titles are in place, we cannot have a full confidence that what we give as a matter of humanity is not what we already owe as a matter of justice. If what is mine is unjustly so, then it is not my place to give, but my duty to return. Otherwise, I would simply return what rightfully belongs to the other in the guise of humanitarian aid. So not only is it essential to clearly distinguish between claims of humanity and claims of justice and avoid any attempt to define one in terms of the other, it might also be necessary to establish a priority of moral action between the two since the demands of the former may well depend on the latter being in place. For these reasons, um, I suggest that we should move away from or at least complement the humanitarian moral grammar of disaster relief and rethink the grounds of our responsibility for disaster preparedness in terms of justice. 
In the next section, I examine properly global relational theories of justice and whether they provide a suitable response to disaster. Relational theories of global justice argue that some important feature of our relations across state borders trigger duties of justice. Still, some global conceptions of relational justice are not particularly well suited to ground international disaster response. They only provide a partial answer and leave unaddressed other aspects. The reason for this is that they take the distinction between the social and natural inequality to be morally salient and take the social to be the priority maker for public action. They hold that deprivations rooted in social causes are of greater moral importance and stipulate a moral hierarchy between the man-made aspects of disaster and those aspects that are not related to human activity. I call this problem the priority of the social over the natural. Um, a prime example is a causal relational account of global justice. For short here, I will call it causal relationism, most prominent in Thomas Pogge's work. Uh, his main contention with rival theories of global justice is that their moral evaluation is overly focused on the distribution of goods or ills among recipients, quoting what ought recipients to be able to have or to be, end quote. As a consequence, they are blind, morally speaking, regarding the origins of ill health, whether health inequalities or deprivations more generally merely happen to exist or they are brought about, is a distinction of great moral import that these theories, according to Pogge, fail to appreciate. Pogge's move is a conceptual shift from a passive concept of justice, from justice as promoting a just distribution, to an active concept to justice as treating people justly. He invites us to focus on the agents and think about injustice as something that is done or not to the recipients of poverty and ill health. Pogge's central thesis holds that, quoting, the strength of our moral reason to prevent or mitigate particular medical conditions depends not only on distributional factors, rather it depends also on relational factors, that is on how we are related to the medical conditions they suffer, end quote. Notice that the distribution versus action is not an either-or question for Pocky. Distributions do matter morally, but it also matters whether and how agents are related to deprivations. Agents may be unrelated, they may be directly causing them, or indirectly implicated in upholding social arrangements that impact on them in various ways. To nuance the problem of injustice even further, in addition to the causal role individuals and their institutions may have, Pogge stresses the imp importance of the implicit attitude of social institutions. He distinguishes between six ways in which social institutions may affect people's health conditions, corresponding to the strength of moral reasons to mitigate their effects. Since these categories are present as a scalar view of negative and positive responsibility, it is not clear where we should draw the line between an injustice and those health deprivations that are not matters of justice but raise different kinds of moral concerns. Some read Pogge as categorically drawing the line between medical conditions we are causally related to as a matter of justice versus those we are unrelated to as matters of different moral concern. Indeed, one may gather from some of Pogge's remarks that institutions that avoidably leave unmitigated the effects of natural defects raise the questions whether they are matters of justice at all. More often, however, the different sources of health deprivations are presented in a scalar view of responsibility as cases of greater versus lesser injustice. On either reading, and he can help us out here later, on either reading of Pogge's position, natural deprivations have a lower priority in terms of our moral reason to mitigate them. They entail a weaker moral responsibility compared to the grave injustices of legally mandated or authorized institutional harms. Applying the active concept of justice, for something to be unjust, certain agents must have or share responsibility for the injustice. Purely natural judicanda, such as natural disasters, are not capable of being just or unjust, at least not in themselves. They are not problems of justice in the sense that there is no social or institutional standpoint from where those carrying the burden were treated unjustly. So at this point, um, my question is, how can we think about um, an adequate normative response to disaster, and how can relational theories give a higher priority to mitigating natural impairments? And um, just to lay the steps of my arguments on the table, I see two, two strategies here. 
The first strategy is to argue that natural sources of disadvantage are in some important sense social. So we can use the natural is social slogan. And um, as I will argue, we can conceive of what I call the social model of disaster disadvantage, drawing on an analogy with the social model of disability. The second strategy is that to locate the value of equality in our relationship or how we stand vis-a-vis -vis one another in the relevant, in this case, global community, and argue that what it means for institutions and policies to treat people justly is that they support people's basic capacities or social functionings to participate in public life on an equal footing with one another. And I will call this the relational egalitarian approach to disaster disadvantage. Okay, so the first strategy, the natural is social. Natural sources of disadvantage are in some important sense social. There are two ways in which natural deprivations are intertwined with social inequalities that are often drawn together in the literature. Instead, I think it is worth distinguishing for the purpose of normative analysis. First, they are intertwined in their origins, and second, they are intertwined in their effects. And I should also add that both of these are explicitly acknowledged by Pogge, which renders his causal relationalism sensitive to natural sources of deprivation. So the first, um, how they are intertwined, the natural and the social being intertwined in their origins. First, natural causes of illness and deprivation are rarely fully independent of social inequalities in their causal origins. The relationship between natural and social health inequalities is complex, and the more we learn from biomedical research and social epidemiology, the more restricted the domain of purely naturally occurring ill health becomes. To exemplify, um, Many analysts, to exemplify with disaster, um, many analysts have brought to bear the global political economy and failed international health governance, as well as lack of effective government and cultural factors at the local level on the recent Ebola crisis. In one of the most comprehensive accounts, Solomon Benatar writes that, quoting, the deepest, less easily perceived, and largely ignored explanation is that the epidemic is one of many manifestations of failed human and social development that has brought countries like Liberia and Sierra Leone to dangerous tipping points. So social factors have played a significant role in the escalation of the disease outbreak into a large-scale epidemic. Now the problem with this first um, accounting for the natural as social is that from the normative point of view they are there are residual purely natural impairments that are left unaddressed. Fatal genetic disease or more importantly for our cause, human suffering due to natural disasters. While they may, may be residual in the normative sense from the point of view of causal relationism, they affect the life, health and livelihoods of millions of people each year. Natural disasters throughout history have always meant peaks in mortality and morbidity, but their scale and scope has significantly increased since the 1990s. Uh, Leaning and Guha Sapir report that since the 1990s, 270 million people are affected each year. Um, so there is a second sense in which natural inequalities are intertwined with the social world that may bring such purely natural inequalities into the purview of justice. Naturally occurring events or biological properties of persons interact with the social and institutional structure which transforms them into socially relevant disadvantage. It is one thing to say that the origins of a particular disease outbreak or an earthquake cannot be just or unjust, but how the effect of a natural cause is played out in society is often deeply entangled with various forms of unjust social and institutional arrangements. To what extent people are affected by and able to cope in the aftermath of a natural disaster may nevertheless be unjust due to existing inequities in exposure and preparedness. To echo Rawls, what is unjust is not that these natural ills are occurring, but how institutions deal with them. Justice is concerned with what we can socially control or affect. This idea resonates with Michael Marmot's well-known well social determinants of health model. He writes that, quoting, the unnecessary disease and suffering of the disadvantaged, whether in poor countries or rich, is a result of the way we organize our affairs in society, where systematic differences in health are avoidable by reasonable action. They are, quite simply, unfair. It is this that we label health inequity as opposed to health inequality, end quote. 
So the emphasis on what is humanly controllable, what we have humanly caused, is rather clear. It is much less clear from Marmot's account what is meant by avoidable, by reasonable action, and how it relates to injustice or unfairness. There are many ways a society can exert its influence and transform a natural impairment into an advantage or a disadvantage. Jonathan Wolf's views on disability are particularly helpful here. He distinguishes three ways in which a society can address a natural impairment to broaden the opportunity sets of persons. First, we may act on the person's internal resources via medical treatment or training her capacities. Second, we may act on her external resources via cash transfer or ta more targeted resources. And most importantly, we can change the social and material structure within which their action takes place. This latter may involve changing the physical environment and infrastructure, changing laws and policies, or changing social norms and cultural practices that are stigmatizing, demeaning, or generate social disadvantage from natural differences. This so-called social model of disability may be suitably adjusted to natural disasters, I argue, and we may call it the social model of disaster disadvantage. What we are morally assessing is how social and institutional arrangements deal with disaster, which includes the way they treat or affect people, both prior to the disaster, in terms of preparedness and risk management, and how they respond once the disaster hits. Um, one vivid example may be found in Iris Young's analysis of the complex social structural processes that have led to the devastating effects of Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. Poor maintenance of infrastructure for decades, including roads, bridges, dams, water supplies, hazardous waste, have played a crucial role. Rising poverty rates, especially among the Latino and black populations, were coupled with the dogma of self-sufficiency in public assistance. And the hurricane revealed how deadly such lack of solidari solidarity can be. Disaster response was also fused with racial and class tensions and discrimination that were brought to the forefront. Not least, the war on terror has diverted attention, resources, and institutional capacity from natural disasters that accounts for some of the failures and inefficiencies in mitigating the effects of the hurricane. So, of course, this is a brief sketch here, but I think that the social model of disadvantage is a very powerful idea and an important step in giving higher priority to mitigating natural disasters. I see two problems with it. One is, a, I think, a smaller one. So, the first is that it maintains the priority of the social and deals with natural inequalities as problems of justice to the extent that seemingly natural differences should be regarded as social. Second, and I think more importantly, the social model does not in itself st specify any standard of justice. It lacks the guiding normative ideal. How should a society be rearranged? By what legitimate means? The just organization of social institutions is a matter of an independent procedure of reciprocal justification concerning the limits of social responsibility among persons capable of giving and receiving reasons. So I think, uh, we can here turn to the second strategy to fill in this gap, um, which I call this relational egalitarian approach to disaster disadvantage. But let me come back for a second to Pogge's causal relationalism. His account of what it means for institutions to treat people justly is to mitigate the effects of morally arbitrary factors according to the scalar view of social institutional responsibility and to consider lower priority naturally occurring deprivations, all else being equal. This, however, is only one way of spelling out the content of just institutional treatment. What it means to treat people justly and what just institutional treatment requires are precisely the fundamental questions that divide theories of social justice. It is a matter of what we take to be reciprocally justifiable among equals. The question to be answered by the justificatory community is whether and to what extent should society take responsibility for and mitigate the various sources of disadvantage from life prospects? Should the effects of socially produced, naturally occurring, or self-inflicted disadvantage be mitigated? In what order of priority and why? A compelling answer, departing from Pogge's solution, is the idea that institutions treat people justly 
when they create and uphold the conditions for people to stand as equals in a political community. I explore this relational egalitarian path to global disaster justice in this last section of the talk. At its core lies the idea of equal standing in the global community, and the injustice of unequal life prospect is worked out on the basis of that ideal. Relational egalitarianism has two core features. First, rather than locating the value of equality in a particular distribution of um, goods and ills, it locates the value of equality in what it means to stand as equals vis-a-vis -vis one another as members of the global community. Second, it provides a substantive response to what it means for institutions to treat persons equally, that is, as having equal standing, and what that implies for mitigating disadvantage. On Elizabeth Anderson's democratic egalitarian version of the view, institutions treat people justly when they are indifferent between the social, the natural, and the self-caused origins of capability deprivations, up to the point where equal standing and a threshold capacity to participate in public life is at stake. Extending the idea globally and applying it to disaster, and this is very sketchy here, but uh, so an appropriate concern towards persons in equal standing requires that the way global institutions deal with or transform the effects of natural disaster into social disadvantage or opportunity is an expression of treating them as equals. In terms of their normative character, institutions are never morally neutral, even with the regard to naturally occurring health deprivations. They either allow their effects to manifest in person's life prospects, or they mitigate them by preventing them or compensating for their effects. How institutions deal with the various sources of inequality involves a prior action or decision, decision which involves treating certain people with certain medical conditions in certain ways. A system of healthcare financing that, that does not address the health effects of natural health deficits or the effect of personal choices does not merely allow persons with genetic heart condition, diabetes, or immune deficiency to suffer from natural causes. It also denies them equal standing or equal opportunities to participate in social life. What is taken to be a morally neutral institutional inaction by some, in effect, condemns people to suffering and to live on the brink of communal life or any life at all. Allowing um, young cause this form of unjust uh, Iris Young calls this form of unjust treatment marginalization, which involves an unjustified denial of opportunities. So a person living with disease is not merely lacking a good as adequate health, they are also treated unjustly by institutions, denied a fair chance in life or equal standing as members of a community. What I'm proposing is to use the relational normative ideal equal standing in the global community to assess how the global political and economic determinants can permissibly affect the vulnerability of persons to natural disaster. What it requires is that the way global institutions deal with the effects of natural and domestic ills is governed by the ideal of treating people as equals and enables, to function, enables them to function as equals in the global community. This provides plenty of ground to object to international institutions and policies that leave unaddressed the plight of millions of people with serious but preventable diseases, leaving them at the brink of human existence, rather than enabling them to be members of the global community in equal standing. Thank you. Thank you very much. A matter of clarification, could you say a bit more about what this global community is? How demanding or how loosely do you want to, to take it? Because it's not so obvious what equal standing that community means. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So, um, okay, work in progress. <laughs> um, so, extending the democratic ideal of relational equality uh, is of course requires very careful adjustments on many different points and how to, how to characterize equal standing is one of the problems or one of the questions that you need to, how thick or thin is this, um, um, what in the domestic setting is called social equality or social uh, relations um, and what we want that to be. Definitely, I mean, at a minimal level, you would include um, 
justifiability with regards to the effects of global rules and institutions, but also not necessarily uh, merely in terms of the social product, right, and the distribution of this surplus, but also in terms of, and I think this is the additional of how they treat people when natural harms or ills occur. But of course, the second point is to, to um, or the second difficulty in extending the ideal is what kind of global ills may threaten the, this equal standing. And one source um, that I'm relying on here is the Oslo Commission's um, recent report on the global political determinants of health. And I think that that provides very rich resources about seven different aspects of global governance that systematically skew the benefits of the of the, the global order, as um, Boges put it, to, to the most vulnerable populations of the world, and that many ways in which you know disaster pre preparedness is affected here. And the third problem, I think this is the biggest challenge probably for the ideal, and might be the reason why theorists like Pog go for a more minimalist human rights account, is as Anderson's noted, the uh, relational idea is, a, um, is an ideal-driven account. And she takes this from, from Rawls, whereby what it means to stand as equals vis-a-vis -vis one another is worked out from ideals, public ideals latent in the political culture of a liberal democratic community. And that's what Rawls relies on. That's what Anderson then works out in a different way. In the global political community, what, what we can take for granted as as global citizens, right? And what, what does it mean to be a global citizen? And what sort of um, um, solidarity that relationship requires and what kind of safeguards and protections we owe one another. I think it's less clear and, and you know, interpretations go either way. I think there's reason to, to go for a, a bit more stronger than minimalist account and there might be also reasons to consider not only threshold criterions for distributive justice globally, such as human rights or sufficiency in capabilities, but to reduce the gap and reduce inequalities. And in particular, when we're talking about the relational ideal, these range concerns or comparative relative inequality is going to be relevant for yeah, bargaining within international institutions and and certain um, to avoid certain kinds of um, stigma, to avoid certain kinds of um, uh, power asymmetries in the global, for example, in the development business or in the international health aid and so on. So it, it's a bit sketchy and vague, but these are kind of all the things you need to consider before you have a global relational theory of justice. Um, so intuitively thinking, one of the things that happens in disasters is that you have extreme resource scarcity at least temporal scarcity. So you have to make decisions about setting priorities. In the most extreme cases, you have to do something like triage. Now, is your view of relational egalitarianism able to say anything about these sort of decisions that you have to make? And is it something that you think it should be doing, or, is, so you, th or you think it's a separate issue? Mm, thanks, it is a challenge. <laughs> uh, and that's really important, right, because exactly by drawing together these various sources, it does not really give you a, um, a priority. So I think one sort of initial answer is that this view is probably more important in, in the disaster preparedness area and, and what it means to render people less vulnerable to disasters themselves and what justice requires in that regard. And yes, I guess there will be very hard decisions to make and that will require maybe triage or some other accounts of priority setting where this view is not very useful. But um, thanks for the question. I'll, I'll, I'll think about that more. So I have a kind of question about the theoretical foundation of this. Mm -hmm. So as I see it, uh, the uh, on the side of the more consequentialist treatment of justice, uh, you and Rawls are really very closely allied, right? There's not, not much of a difference. Rawls would say, for example, that self-respect is the fundamental social mm -hmm. primary good, and his whole theory is supposed to express the best possible distribution of self-respect. 
we look at where people fall short, uh, self-respect being highly uh, dependent on the respect that one gets from other people. And we are trying to look at the overall distribution and we try in particular to avoid situations where some people fall short significantly relative to others, have enjoy less respect in their community uh, than the others do. And you say something very similar. You say we look at this distribution of uh, political equality and we try to make uh, as small as possible the situations where people fall short, where they are not respected and accepted as equals in their community. So, and if I understood you correctly, you agree with Rawls that we leave aside why it is that certain people fall short. So we are not paying attention to the causality between the institutional arrangements on the one hand and the distribution of whatever it is that they produce on the other hand. Whereas I see myself in opposition to Rawls and of course now also to you, I have to say, by saying that these causes do matter. So it does matter whether somebody falls short of being able to function as an equal in society because they smoked their whole lives and got lung disease or because they fall short because they were stigmatized and by the state uh, you know, despised and excluded and so on as people who have the wrong sexual preference or the wrong religion or the wrong appearance or the wrong ethnicity or the wrong native language or something of that sort. So I would say that other things being equal, in particular the extent to which they are less able to function as equals being equal, it is much worse if their deficit is due to this deliberate stigmatization, this active exclusion, than if it is due to the fact that they uh, smoked or in a, in a way brought this upon themselves in a way that society could have but didn't mitigate. Mm -hmm. And so I would correspondingly give priority to rectifying injustices of the first sort, where it is deliberate stigmatization and so on, over injustice of the second sort, even if the harm that is done, the harm that is suffered by individuals is equally great. Does Thank that make you. sense? Yes, absolutely. And it is, of course, a, a point of um, disagreement and one that I will also have to think more about. So one way to answer um, that is not a full answer is actually, I think, present also in your um, work is that the distinction might make sense at the, at the sort of the, the purely conceptual level but almost never in reality these causes can be properly um, teased out. So the question is whether the distinction, given this very strong intertwinedness in the, the two kinds of ways that I've um, presented, do we want to give it the, the moral and especially the political weight that, that, uh, that often happens? So that's, that's one thing. Should that really carry the burden, um, the distinction itself? Um, and the second way, again, just a partial answer, is I, I guess the, the, the disagreement will, be, will have to be teased out at the level of where we place the value of equality. And I think if you're committed, or you, you might not be, <laughs> but if... if um, and it is actually one reading of Rawls via Anderson. Um, so if we are committed to this ideal of standing as equals vis-a-vis -vis one another and that being the, the, the core of what it means to treat each other as equals, um, then I think there might be good reasons to say that it, it doesn't matter what caused it, that, that um, it's much more important that that we all have this, and it's really, I think, a, a sort of a threshold capacity that we make sure that you know people get a second and third and even fourth chances in life. Um, for, for example, with related to the to the self-caused injuries, but it's not it's not a full response. It's something I'm still working on. So um, I'll tease out in more detail that that when falling short of equal standing, why? Doesn't the distinction matter, or why, or should it matter? So thanks. Okay. Uh, 
first of all, thank you for this really so provoking uh, <coughs> presentation. Maybe my question will be really broad, or maybe I disastrously just misunderstood you, but my question is like, to what extent or how this approach you put forward could avoid a form of, let's say, global paternalism in the form of interventionalism wrongly understood, or I don't know if it makes sense. <laughs> Trying to think. So, if it, the focus on, so one way that, that, that th these kinds of views could be paternalistic if they, they focus, for example, overly on, on increasing people's external resources by targeted, targeted development. But I think the, where you can avoid um, paternalism is um, precisely by focusing on these changing social and material structures that rely on some idea of reciprocal justifiability whereby subjecting yourself to the general will is the question. So I, we might need to talk more about it where, where you think paternalism might creep up again, uh, but I don't yet see the problem sort of putting the weight on other aspects of mitigating natural causes I think could be, but this precisely tries to um, you know, give voice to the, to the marginalized and and lift them up in a, in a form, but yeah, okay, we can talk about it more. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Esther.